Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone to this uh, AI ethics seminar at the Chalmers University of Technology. Uh, our speaker for today is uh, Ulla Hegström from Chalmers. Um, Ulla, a brief introduction. Uh, you are a professor of mathematical statistics. You have pu published a lot in probability theory, uh, but for a long time now, uh, you have also been interested in technological development and risks. Uh, and in the last few years, you have focused much on AI. You have published at least two books uh, where you discuss the subject. So uh, very welcome as a presenter to today's semi uh, seminar. Uh, I'd just like to add that we will be recording this seminar. So if you, for any reason, would like not to be recorded, uh, uh, please let us know. Um, uh, and you have al uh, already started the recording now, Ulle, mm, I think. Right. Okay, uh, I'll leave the presentation to you, Ulle. Thank you very Go much. Uh, I will screen share. Um, like that. Can you see my cover slide? Very good. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ville, for the kind introduction. Uh, I will uh, be talking today about the ethics of racing towards the AI precipice. So I expect uh, none of you has failed to notice that that uh, uh, quite a lot has happened in the AI field in 2023. It's been quite an amazing year. At, and at the center of much of the attention has been the company OpenAI, uh, who, I mean, they had already, uh, before uh, the turn to 2023, they had just released the GPT product, but the real, I think, technological breakthrough was with uh, GPT-4, which was released in March and uh, which uh, performs so spectacularly across such a broad range, uh, range of conversational topics that uh, this uh, group at Microsoft Research, who, who had access to, to an advanced version of GPT-4 before the release, uh, when, when they reported on its capabilities, they put the, the word sparks of artificial general intelligence in the title. So not the quite the uh, long sought for holy grail of AI, artificial general intelligence, but sparks of it. In any case, um, it, it no longer uh, makes sense to talk about this AGI versus narrow AI dichotomy uh, because uh, GPT-4 is, is clearly in, in a gray area between uh, these things. Uh, a lot else has happened. And uh, last month we had quite some turbulence uh, at OpenAI. I was very, very surprised when early in the morning my phone told me that uh, Sam Altman had been uh, fired. Uh, I mean, uh, OpenAI has been a spectacularly successful uh, company and Sam Altman uh, was on board already from the start in 2015 and brought the company uh, from basically nothing to evaluation of, I think the latest number was $80 billion. Um, so, quite uh, quite successful, but but he was fired. Uh, the turbulence continued, and I think it was four or five days later that uh, he was re-instantiated as CEO and parts of the board had to leave. Instead, there were speculations about the reasons uh, for the initial firings. We don't have uh, the complete answers yet, but but some of these speculations, were about perhaps there was disagreement about some spectacular uh, discovery about some some, some new uh, breakthrough towards artificial uh, general intelligence. That that is probably not the case. Uh, but I'm going to uh, get back to what what was most likely behind uh, this uh, turbulence. Uh, but but bef before I'll talk about that, I'm going to 
zoom out uh, quite a bit and talk about the present day uh, developments uh, from from a longer uh, time, a broader and longer time perspective. This is an artist's imagination of what uh, humans may have looked like uh, two million years ago when we we're still just Homo habilis, uh, a relatively unremarkable species on the savanna. And from there, we have had an incredible uh, trajectory and we are quite near, I think, the stage of technological maturity uh, represented by this picture on the uh, upper right, uh, which, um, well, uh, I think there's good hope that, that uh, uh, sometime in the not too far future, uh, we will have solved uh, most or all of our mundane problems around uh, climate change, global health, poverty, and so on and so forth. And we can go on and do whatever we really want and, and aspire to do. So when, when, when one can ask, what is it that brought us from here to 99.9 .9 or so percent of the way here? And I would say this has really nothing to do with our muscular strength or our physical endurance or other physical uh, characteristics. It's it's all about uh, human intelligence. Intelligence had, has turned out to be a spectacularly uh, useful resource. And once you realize that the, the, the unique power of intelligence, uh, this suggests that the current uh, 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 at the current time when we are on our way to automate and delegate this unique resource to machines could, could be a very, very important turning point uh, in, in the history of humanity. I think that if we do it right, it's, it's probably the one technology that can do the most towards achieving this uh, uh, utopia-like uh, technological maturity and uh, a great flourishing society. On the other hand, if we don't do it right, well, if you look back at our prehistory, uh, the history has not been kind to um, species that have found themselves uh, to be uh, the second uh, most intelligent species on the planet or even further down. It usually involves a lack of control. So if we end up in a situation where uh, we have created machines that are more intelligent than us, and that kind could be actually could be quite close. Then um, things might turn out to be quite precarious. So one thinker, early thinker, who, who uh, thought about this was Alan Turing. As you know, most of his work was was very mathematical and, and uh, very technical. But uh, towards the end of his very uh, tragically short life. Uh, ended in 1954, he allowed himself a few more futuristic and philosophical speculation about where the technology would be leading that he had helped invent. So in 1951, he uh, wrote this. My contention is that machines can be constructed which will simulate the behavior of the human mind very closely. Let us now assume for the sake of argument that these machines are a genuine possibility and look at the consequences of constructing them. It seems probable that once the machine thinking method has started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. There would be no question of the machines dying and they would be able to converse with each other to sharpen their wits. At st some stage, therefore, we have to expect the machines to take control. And this is especially this final sentence is, is uh, quite uh, ominous. Um, so how did the, the academic and, and, and scientific community react to this? Well, mostly by just uh, ignoring the issue for the next half century uh, uh, or so. And it was only around the turn of the millennium that a few thinkers uh, started to, to, to they, they were very few in the beginning, started to think seriously about this uh, issue. And one of the pioneers here, uh, is uh, this guy, Elsie Yudkowsky, 
uh, who um, can uh, take credit for really um, starting the field, which is now called AI alignment, and which is about making sure that at this time point that Turing talks about when we, we should expect the machines to take control, making sure that they these machines have uh, goals uh, and drives and values that are aligned with ours, that are aligned with promoting human flourishing uh, and so on. Uh, this uh, report from 2008 was quite influential in, 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 in getting the research area of AI alignment uh, started. It certainly influenced me quite a lot. And I'm going to quote one sentence from this report, which is uh, Yudkowsky's uh, dramatic uh, des description of, of what he considers to be the default scenario if we uh, ignore the problem or, or of AI alignment or otherwise uh, fail to carry out the, 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 the project of aligning the goals and values of the first really, really intelligent machines with ours. So here's his default scenario for what happens if we fail to do this. The AI does not hate you, nor does it love you, but you are made out of atoms, which it can use for something else. And we certainly don't want to end up in, in um, conflict with a superior kind of being with uh, this as uh, one of the um, founding, uh, one of the value disagreements uh, between species here. So, so this is something we should avoid. And, and the, the, the key thing here is to have working solutions for AI alignment ready for the time point when, when we um, get machines that are, are so capable that they might uh, take control of the world. How much time do we have for this? Well, that's that's a contested issue, and I don't want to talk about any, any deterministic schedule because I mean it depends on what we choose to do. But 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 it, it's still interesting to to discuss where the trends are pointing, uh, and and um, and uh, what what is on the roadmap of the possible and so on. So the the most uh, ambitious report written on this topic is from 2020, and it's about, uh, by this researcher, Ajaya Kotra. Uh, the report is called Forecasting Transformative AI with Biological Anchors, where he, it, it's a very thick, ambitious report, something like 100 pages. And, and, and the uh, main methodology is, is to look at various biological benchmarks, including the human brain, but also uh, things like uh, the amount of uh, information uh, that is fed to a human from infancy, infancy up to adulthood. Uh, so this might somehow correspond to the amount of, of, of training you need uh, to, to uh, uh, do uh, to build an advanced AI. Uh, also, another benchmark here is, is the amount of information processing done in the evolutionary history on our planet as a whole. So, so Kotra is very agnostic about uh, which of these benchmarks, is, if any, is, is the most relevant, and also about the speed of, of, of the, um, future technological pro progress and so on, but 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 she puts all these uncertainties together, arrives at a, a probability distribution uh, for the time when we first get an AI so advanced that that it's uh, able on its own to to uh, transform uh, civilization as much as the industrial revolution did, and and this. Bayesian probability distribution ends up spread out all over the present century with a little bit probability mass also after 2100. But but she put the um, she arrived at a median of 2050, 
Uh, then things uh, started to accelerate after the publication of this report in 2020. And two years later, in the summer of 2022, she published a shorter paper where she uh, discussed how she had revised her thinking in view of recent uh, developments. And the new um, uh, her new median was at 2040. So speaking today in 2023, that's 17 years away. Uh, now, I know for for a fact that that uh, Kotra ha has shortened her timelines even more since then. Others have done too, and the general tendency is that the closer that you get to the the, the center of these developments in in, in the uh, Bay Area AI community around San Francisco and Silicon Valley, the closer you get to there, uh, the shorter timelines. Uh, do people um, tend to have. So we might not have so much time and, and more and more people at at the leading companies and around them are, are talking about the possibilities of drastic things happening uh, possibly in the present decade. But, but we, I mean, th there's the only honest answer to how much time we have has to have a large uh, component of uncertainty. We, we really don't know, but it's good to be prepared. But this shortening of the timelines, at least in, in distribution, is, is, is the main difference really between the situation in April 2021, when I uh, published my first uh, edition of my book, Tank and the Machine, unfortunately only in Swedish, and the second edition, which came uh, last month. And I felt that I really was a need for a, a second uh, edition because so much had happened in the meantime uh, with all these um, large language models and other generative AI making uh, great progress towards what might possibly be artificial general uh, intelligence. Uh, so uh, at this time in 2021, I was still thinking about the crunch time that uh, Turing was referring to as being at least uh, decades away, but 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 at present time, uh, this is no longer so clear. It could be much much closer. So we better think carefully about this. And 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 with this as a background, we can say a little bit more about the turbulent uh, situation at uh, OpenAI. As I mentioned, the company was uh, funded in 2015 with money from a, a bunch of Silicon Valley uh, billionaire, and it was uh, formed explicitly for the purpose of making this great transition to a world with advanced AI in a way that would be beneficial to uh, all of humanity. So the company has, from the start, a kind of foundational constitutional document, the OpenAI Charter, uh, describing the, the principles of, of what should drive the company. Uh, and and, and uh, the central passage here is that OpenAI's mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence, by which we mean highly autonomous systems that outperform humans at most economically valuable work, benefits all of humanity. We will attempt to directly build safe and beneficial AGI but we'll also consider our mission fulfilled if our work aids others to achieve this outcome. And, and the um, uh, role of uh, AI's board is, is, is mainly just to, to protect the ideas in this charter. So it's quite unlike uh, the, the role of the board in, in a normal uh, commercial uh, company where it's mostly about protecting the interests of shareholders. Um, so this led immediately upon the firing of Altman to a speculation that, that the, the, there's this tension between the commercial interests of OpenAI, which in practice have become more and more important with investments from Microsoft uh, and all that. That that I mean, for OpenAI to, to push forward uh, as much as they had technologically, they had, have had to have investors money and this this has led to uh, compromises and a, a tension between this ideological uh, idealistic stuff in the charter versus more uh, 
the more co commercial side of things. So it was a natural thing to guess that the board thought that that uh, Altman was pushing uh, too much towards the commercial side. Now there has been very little to to to, to back that up, and what was said in the uh, early reports from the firing. And, and what the board themselves said, they had a very, very short statement involving Altman not having been totally candid in their communication, which is, of course, a bad situation to have between a CEO uh, and uh, a board. Uh, and uh, it, 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 so there have been other sources uh, since then, and most of them point in the direction that there, there were uh, conflicts in the board boiling down to one board member, Helen Toner, who's uh, an academic at Georgetown uh, University, had co-authored a paper which compared some of the leading AI companies uh, in terms of, of their safety work and so on. And there was some criticism of open AI and they held forth a competitor as being stronger in certain aspects. And Sam Altman was really mad about this and started to, to to scheming and talking to various other board members about pushing Helen Toner out. The board members figured out what Sam Altman was up to and that this was a, was a socially unacceptable situation. They, they felt uh, the need to push Altman out. And then came this situation where Altman was, was uh, recruited by uh, Microsoft and he could take all his employees with him. And there was this uh, list of uh, signatures, uh, including almost all of the employees at OpenAI, uh, urging for the reinstatement of Sam Altman. And he won this power struggle. Uh, uh, and I think that, so so, so, so th this is basically what, what, what happened. It was not directly about uh, commercialization versus safety issues. Uh, but rather about uh, a breakdown of trust. But now Sam Altman is, is back. Uh, we have the beginning of the new board. It's all, not all seats are filled, but 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 OpenAI is, is moving forward uh, as before, we believe. Um, so what I'm going to do here is, is to, uh, as indicated in the title, I'm, I'm going to uh, discuss the ethics of racing forward in the way that OpenAI and, and, and their competitors are doing in terms of more and more capable AIs, despite uh, the risks involved. Now, I, I'm of course entirely aware that there are lots of arguments against taking such extreme risks um, seriously. Uh, and I have spent a, a, a quite a few talks this year and earlier in addressing these arguments. Uh, but for today's talk, I'll, I'll just bracket that discussion and just mention that there are various arguments for not taking this seriously and, and, and a, a, a systematic taxonomy of such arguments, which I kind of like was recently published. It has categories and subcategories and sub subcategories and so on. And it's quite interesting. I'll just give you the five top level categories here. We have the fizzlers, those who believe that artificial superintelligence uh, is not going to happen. Uh, we, we'll get some kind of all the low-hanging fruit have already been picked phenomenon that, that just uh, causes the de development to, to uh, fizzle without uh, the, the AI reaching uh, extreme levels. Uh, there are the so-called how skeptics who, who accept that artificial superintelligence uh, will happen or might happen, but won't be capable of taking over or destroying the world. In my view, this is a much less sane position that, uh, than the Fizzler position. I mean, I don't, I don't buy into the Fizzler position, but I, I can see the arguments. But, but the idea that we'll have uh, a, a superhuman intelligence around and we're just going to uh, be able to keep it boxed in is just, it makes very little sense. Then there are the wise skeptics, skeptics who think that, okay, artificial super, superintelligence 
uh, might be able to take over if it wanted, but it just won't want it. It doesn't have any reason to destroy the world. It will be friendly, obedient in a manner which is safe and so on. Then we have the solvabilists who just point to the fact that uh, um, up to now, humanity has been quite good at uh, putting in safeguards in our technologies, uh, safety belts in our cars and so on and so forth. And we'll just obviously continue in the same way. The danger can be solved and we have so many safety engineers that this is going to be done in time uh, for, for AI alignment to be implemented before it's too late. And of course, this is this is the situation that I'm, I'm very much hoping for, but I don't think taking this for granted uh, is the thing to do. And I certainly don't think that downplaying safety issues uh, that some famous solvabilists like Jan Le Kun are doing is the way to get this safety work uh, done. Finally, we have what we could call the anthropociders who accept that uh, AI might kill us all, but to think that from the point of view of the universe or whatever, it would be a good thing. So no, no big deal uh, about that. Those, those are the five main categories of, of the AI risk skepticism. Then we have the, the notion that there's some kind of competition between um, near-term and long-term AI safety, and that we could focus on the near-term um, uh, issues. I think that the accelerated timelines for AGI and superintelligence really causes that terminology to break uh, down. And even apart from that, uh, there's it's not a very constructive thing to, to put these um, things uh, against each other. We, we, there's sufficient potential for recruiting uh, AI ethics and uh, AI safety uh, developers to 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 make both kinds both subfields uh, flourish uh, simultaneously. That's my view, at least. Okay, what about ethics here? When we're in a situation where where, where we may be about to construct a technology that uh, can have such tremendous impact, there are ethical issues and, and, and there's much scope for disagreement. But here, I, I want to suggest a candidate for an ethical principle that I hope you will find appealing. Namely, if you are about to build something that you worry might kill all humans, then back off and don't build it. Makes sense, right? And I want to continue this sentence a little bit more by stressing that even if you have concerns that a neighbor might be building the same thing. You should still back off and don't build it. To me, this makes sense. Uh, and I think it would have been wonderful if the following three gentlemen took this principle to heart. Sam Altman, who we already talked about, CEO of OpenAI. Uh, Demis Hassabis, uh, the leader of, of, of Google, Google DeepMind. And uh, Dario Amode, who has the corresponding uh, position at Anthropic. These are the three leading uh, developers of, of cutting edge AI at the present time point. But they are racing ahead. And it's not that they don't, they're, they're certainly not unaware of the risks. We, we can see a lot of statements uh, from, from, from these persons about the risks. So, so for instance, Sam Altman has repeatedly talked about the worst case scenario if, if their uh, breakthrough uh, happens in the wrong way to be lights out for all of us. Dario Amode uh, recently talked in an interview of the probability of uh, the AI breakthrough leading to extinction of humanity being somewhere between 10 and 25%. So, so, so they do take take these risks very seriously. And if you want to point to one document where all three leaders uh, are in on, there's this um, open letter published in May this year uh, with Hasabis, Altman, and Amade as three of the five first signatories. The letter says, it's just this single sentence, mitigating the risk of extinction from A. It should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. There have been suggestions that this is not sincere, 
and and uh, I, I I claim to know not these people personally, but but the culture uh, and and, and um, social environment uh, around them and these companies. Uh, and to me, it's it's quite clear that they they are in an environment where where, where this issue is taken very very seriously. Still, we've had suggestions that this whole thing is a decoy. Uh, and and uh, I don't think it, it makes sense at all because it's just this reaction is totally opposite to what what the reactions has always been when when um, uh, let's say tobacco companies or oil companies are talking about the safety of their stuff. Okay, we we doubt that, and now the AI researchers talk about the the their thing possibly going very very wrong, and we get the same reaction. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, so, um, this ethical principle that I suggested, it's actually not the first time that this, this kind of thinking uh, has, has become an urgent issue, uh, because if we go back to the 1940s and the Manhattan Project, which was uh, beautifully um, uh, told about in, in this summer's um, Oppenheimer, movie. I really liked this movie. And, and, and one of the great things about it is that, uh, that it tells uh, about a key story within the Manhattan Project, which has not been so widely known uh, until this year, but what, which I think is really re relevant to what is currently happening in AI. Namely, towards the time in 1945, uh, when uh, they were able to do um, their first uh, nuclear um, test. This was in July 1945 in the New Mexico desert. But but uh, leading up to that, there was lingering uncertainty about uh, a frightening possibility that maybe, maybe the first nuclear detonation would start a chain reaction in, involving the nitrogen uh, in the atmosphere and just ignite the entire atmosphere and put an end to life on Earth. They didn't believe this was possible, but they thought that, okay, we should look a bit closer into this because uh, before doing anything over hasty. So they, they assigned the task of, of doing that to, to a subgroup of three of their best physicists, including Edward Teller. This is their final report, a kind of ugly thing with classified stamps that I've subsequently been struck over. I just want to show you the final paragraph of this report, which talks about it, well, they come to the expected conclusion that 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 the 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 uh, chain reaction uh, is unlikely, and an unlimited propagation even less likely. But then comes the final sentence, which is, I think, quite interesting. However, the complexity of the argument and the absence of satisfactory experimental foundations makes further work on the subject highly desirable. And the shocking thing, of course, is that with this lingering uncertainty, they still went on. Uh, and did the Trinity test. We survived it. The uh, uh, atmosphere did not ignite, but uh, the point is that they didn't know this uh, at the time. Okay, now fast forward to 2023 and the release of GPT-4. They had a thick uh, technical report uh, about this, including sections about safety testing of the product before release and, and, and from those sections. We have, uh, they, they, they discuss testing for some of the crucial capabilities that those of us worrying about AI catastrophe think a lot about. Autonomous replication and autonomous resource gathering. Those are really uh, uh, dangerous um, capabilities if we should ever get, get an AI uh, that, that can do these things autonomously will get under control. But the conclusion is that the current model is probably not yet capable of autonomously doing so. And then comes the, the, this sentence, which is like an echo from the Los Alamos report. Further research is needed to fully characterize these risks. And uh, with this epistemic situation, they went on and, and released the product. And, and I think we can all see the analogy here. It's quite shocking. Uh, what does Sam Altman think about the the uh, Oppenheimer movie? What did he think when that was released? Well, he tweeted about it. 
And he said this, I was hoping that the Oppenheimer movie would inspire a generation of kids to be physicists, but it really missed the mark on that. And here I think Sam Altman really misses the mark on the movie, which is not about physics. I mean, it's true that, that doing cutting edge physics with the most powerful physical processes known to man uh, and, and pushing the edges of that, that's a really, really cool thing. But, but the movie is not about the physics, it's about the ethics. That's the uh, important thing. So, so uh, at this time I was still in on Twitter and, and I decided to try and write a little parody of Sam Altman's tweet. So I wrote about the movie Joker that I, I was hoping that the Joker movie would inspire a generation of kids to be comedians, but it really missed the mark on that. All right. Uh, what about then what I talk about in the title of this talk, the ethics of racing to the AI precipice, because what these companies, especially uh, OpenAI, Anthropic, and Google DeepMind are doing is that they are in a competition for, for, for making more and more powerful AI and, and, and uh, in a situation where they can't be sure, uh, uh, according to their own reports, that uh, the AIs are not going to start doing dangerous things. How, how, how do they think about this situation? What, what, why are they racing uh, ahead like this, despite awareness of the risks? So there was various candidate uh, responses uh, to this. Uh, might it be that they think of, if not us, then someone else is generally uh, uh, legitimizing of, of, of any action? And, and, and I, I mean, these are, are uh, ethically conscious people and I'm sure they have thought about this and I'm sure that they don't uh, buy into this principle as, as, as the last word in situations like, is it okay to, to uh, take a job as a guard and an executioner at, at uh, the Auschwitz concentration camp, uh, for instance, if you know that if you don't take the job, uh, others uh, will do it. I think that they would answer no to this, but this could, I, ideas like that might still play a role. Uh, another thing that might play a role is, is that uh, these are people who, who are generally uh, young and, and, and very uh, successful in their engineering careers, and, and they probably wouldn't be at the cutting edge of today's AI research if they didn't have this this culture of, of uh, we can handle it. Uh, so so, so uh, there may be an overestimation going on there in, in their ability to actually, even though that we don't have a solution um, in sight for AI alignment, uh, they think, uh, well, they expect to, to, to be able to handle it anyway. One idea which I know is, is present both at OpenAI and uh, Anthropic is that they think that they themselves have the best strategy for AI safety and AI alignment, so that they consider it important, not just from their own selfish interest, for, but for humanity as a whole, uh, that they are, beat their competitors uh, to, to the great breakthrough. At OpenAI, they think it's really, really important to humanity that OpenAI comes first. And, and at Anthropic, they have the corresponding idea that it's important that Anthropic comes first. Now, they both cannot be right about this. And I would really love for them to sit down and, and uh, sort this out uh, with each other. But this is another factor. And um, there's also this general thing that it, no matter how much they write into their charters, or they have a culture about saving the world and so on, they, they are still uh, under the influence of, of, of company and market incentives that are, are not aligned with this. And, and I think that it takes basically a superhumanly ethical person to, to, to avoid entirely being influenced by this. So I, I think that uh, what we see is, is not super surprising given a mix of these possible reasons for racing forward, even though um, uh, they are aware of the risks. So I don't sympathize with their racing forward, but I think that it, it is uh, sociologically and, and uh, psychologically understandable uh, for these various reasons. 
Okay, we need very quickly, not just wrap up this talk, but also to solve AI alignment. There are various approaches on the table. Uh, one that I put much emphasis, but in, in the first edition of my book, but which has somewhat lost the ground is Stuart Russell's program based on inverse reinforcement learning where, where the AIs look at humans to figure out our values and, and, uh, and uh, should have the goal then to implement uh, our values. The, the one uh, approach that, that dominates in, in, in taming current large language models is reinforcement learning with human feedback where you have lots and lots of humans sitting down in front of their screens and responding with thumbs up or thumbs down to various responses from the um, from the large language models uh, wh whose parameters are then tweaked in the direction of getting better responses. Uh, Anthropic has a very more automated variant of this called constitutional AI. There is uh, mechanistic interpretability. And none of these, I mean, these are approaches, they are all interesting. But none of them seem to be on track to, to a clear solution to the problem. So what do you do? Well, a drastic solution might be to de delegate the whole problem to an AI. And this, I mean, you could argue that it sounds crazy. If we're afraid of advanced AI, what do we do? We build an advanced AI to solve this problem for us. It's a leap out in the dark. Who, who would ever think of doing that? Well, open AI, this is the core of their so-called super alignment project, which was announced a few months ago, uh, and which is a project running from 2023 to 2027, which is meant to, to, to solve the entire alignment problem in a way that works also for super intelligent AI. This might work, but it's not something that I think that we should stake uh, our lives and the rest of human uh, civilization on uh, working. So the, the whole situation is very uncertain. As here, Yudkovsky uh, is quite pessimistic at this point. Most people working on AI alignment are, are not as pessimistic, uh, but I think that uh, the argument that Yudkovsky puts forth are interesting, and, and, and the, the, um, the rational thing to do here is to, like Chris Ola and, at Anthropic, to have a uh, a Bayesian probability distribution for how difficult the uh, AI alignment problem is. Somewhere between trivial and impossible with steam engine, Apollo, and P versus NP uh, in between. Uh, most um, AI alignment researchers, uh, Anthropic and elsewhere, think it's somewhere around here. But I think that if, if Yudkovsky is right and it's more like here, then we really that's very, very important information. So, so, so we should think harder about that. And, and if it turns out that, that AI alignment seems so hard that, that we're not on track to solving it on time, then there's the issue of pulling the brakes. Uh, this used to be a ta taboo topic. It was taboo already 18 months ago, but, but, but not anymore. And an important step to making it non-taboo is, is the FLI open letter on pausing uh, giant AI experiments uh, from uh, March this year, shortly after uh, GPT-4. The discussion uh, continues. Uh, the six month post discussed in the letter is too crude a thing, but there are lots of variations and, and uh, uh, adaptive approaches, including Anthropic uh, proposals for responsible uh, scaling. Uh, or, or, or things that are interesting. I think that all of these models when carried out responsibly in practice, it would mean uh, a pause in, in, in uh, training and releasing bigger models already at this point, because we don't know that they are safe and we don't know how to ensure uh, their safety. Uh, but, but, but these are interesting discussions. Uh, the political discussion continues. I think that this open letter I showed you before uh, was, was quite influential, even in high circuits. Rishi Sunak immediately after the letter says, said the government is looking very carefully at this. Um, Ursula von der Leyen, president of the EU Commission, actually quoted the, the letter in full in her State of the Union address in, in September this year. Uh, we had this executive order in October uh, from the White House the first time talking about AI safety. And that's really 
a step forward. And, and as I'm sure you heard about, Rishi Sunak had, had this AI safety summit with uh, top world leaders at Bletchley Park in November. And, and, and uh, uh, participants representing uh, the US, the UK, European Union, uh, China, and so on, uh, signed a statement uh, about the need to, to handle uh, the the risk of serious and even catastrophic harm. I would have liked the word existential here, but uh, we're not quite there yet. So, so I think, I mean, a year ago, I would not have thought it possible uh, to have such a high level statement uh, going this far. So, so, so things are moving, I think, politically in the right uh, direction. Uh, things are even happening in Sweden, but this is less convincing. Uh, the Christensen uh, government uh, initiated uh, a couple of weeks ago an AI commission led by Carl Hendrik Swanberg. And when I see his uh, statements from this press conference, I get a little bit worried. He talks in one sentence about demystifying AI, and then in the next sentence about AI being warm. AI is love and empathy. And I don't think that there's this demystification, and I don't think that it's it's a good approach to 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 rationally balancing uh, opportunities and risks. So so this is a concern. But but uh, okay, Sweden is behind. But 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 Sweden is is not. What happens here is maybe not the most important thing. Uh, so, so overall, I think there's hope. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much Ola, thank for you. the presentation. Uh, now we have a little bit of time for um, questions from the audience. If we have any. Uh, do we have any questions? Do we have anything in the chat? Yeah. Uh, nothing in the chat no, yet. Nothing there. No. So, I mean, I could start with a question. Um, so, I mean, uh, many people still, uh, I mean, they still sort of wonder if, if AI could really lead to existential risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess a natural uh, uh, instinct is that they would like to make up their minds on their own. Uh, no. So what type of... Who are they in your question? Sorry? Who are they who want to make up their minds on their own? Uh, it might be the other companies. researchers, for instance, or people working in technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what kind of knowledge do you think is required to uh, to judge these arguments uh, coming out of Silicon Valley and uh, other places? Uh, do you need Should you be an expert in machine learning technology and data analysis? Or is it perhaps more of a social question with... Uh, uh, designing the right type of regulation around technology that could be relevant. Uh, where where should a, a person start? To I read think, so let me first start on the level of, of our collective epistemics rather than the individual. Uh, and I think that the collective epistemics, there is certainly a great scope for, for um, important input from AI and machine learning researchers but also from people in, in uh, governance, uh, economics, uh, various social sciences, uh, and so on. It, it, it's really an important uh, multidisciplinary problem. About the, from the uh, point of view of the layman, I think that uh, it's not really so much more complicated in principle than for the layman uh, deciding what to think about uh, climate change. Um, or rather, it, it's easier in climate change because there's such great consensus that, that, that uh, we have uh, catastrophic climate change uh, going on. And uh, in the AI field, uh, the judgments are more mixed. But when you see, for instance, this, this uh, open letter with hundreds of names on it, including mine, but in the first five sp spots, you see the three leaders of the leading AI uh, developers, together with Jeffrey Hinton and, and Joshua Bengio, who are 
two of the three of the recipients of the 2018 Turing Award for initially, essentially um, uh, creating the deep learning revolution that is currently driving AI. These are really, really super experts. And to say that just because there are other experts in the field who take a more relaxed view uh, on, on the risks that, that, that you can decide that the risks are not to worry about. I, I think that from the layman's perspective, that's, that's a wrong decision. If, if the experts are um, in disagreement, you should take into account the possibility that either these guys are right and, and the, those guys are right. And for me, it's quite clear that that has to land in taking the risk seriously. Does this make sense? Yes, I mean, I can agree that there are some similarities between uh, AI and climate change in the sense that both questions are very interdisciplinary. Interdisciplinary, they have a, both a technical side and the social the social side. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, could, could, could you you could argue that climate change and uh, the natural science around climate change uh, depends on a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And the reasoning about emerging technologies such as AI, and that we where where we have not seen the future yet, uh, well, data are much more scarce, right, uh, and much more indirect. Yes. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, uh, I, I I think that it's a tempting thing uh, when uh, data are sparse and far between to just take for granted that uh, whatever situation uh, we're in will just continue, that the future will not see much uh, change. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that uh, that's just, uh, that's a mistake. Uh, we're in uh, an era of human history where we're having enormous change. If you plot there's a famous plot where you just look at the global GDP over the last 2000 years. And it looks like totally like a hockey stick. You can hardly see the, the rounding in the lower uh, right corner. And we're sitting on top of this hockey stick and to sit there and expect that all oh, things will probably uh, continue to look like they, they look right now. That's, that's a very over hasty thing uh, to say. So then you should look around and, and ask what are the main factors that will cause things to be different. And I think that the development of machine intelligence is a very, very strong candidate for such a factor. We have a few questions from hmm? the, in the chat. And I'll start with the first one from Claudio, uh, stating that Jeffrey Hinton said that philosophers should not be part of a team working on AI. Is that correct? Or philosophy today is not asking the correct questions to tackle AI issues? Um, I don't know if he said this, but if he did, then I disagree. I mm -hmm. think that uh, uh, philosophers can make important contributions. And in fact, I mean, the most famous professional uh, philosopher that has contributed heavily to this field is Nick Bostrom, uh, who has done very important uh, work, especially on, 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 on bringing the problems uh, to the attention of, of a broader audience, but also with original thinking. Uh, and uh, no, I, I mean, of all the academic disciplines we, we have, I think philosophers are really the most skilled ones at thinking outside the box, which is a skill that is really important here. So I, I think that philosophers should be part of this very interdisciplinary work. Okay, that's a clear answer. Then we have a question from Elsmarie uh, asking, which would the indicators be to indicate that we should pull the alarming hook? Mm -hmm. I mean, what indicators should we be looking for? How do we measure them? Where is the limit when we should push the alarm, the alarm button? For me personally, the limit was reached when we got this report with GPT-4, uh, with this statement that the, the uh, 
machine is probably not capable of doing these really, really capable things, but further research uh, is needed to, to figure this out. I mean, here's actually an idea that goes back to Nick Bostrom, which is called the treacherous turn, which is about the um, AI becoming in increasingly capable of um, social manipulation and how it might uh, at some point learn to hide uh, its intentions and its capabilities until such a point that uh, it would be uh, able to overtake us, uh, at which point it can just uh, go forward with its plans, but but keeping a low profile until that point and, and hiding its intention. This, this, so so, so this, this was first discussed in, in Boston's 2014 book, Superintelligence. Uh, we all thought then that there, this was a, a, a mostly a very theoretical concept, but now that we're seeing the actual abilities of GPT-4 and other uh, advanced uh, large language uh, large language models, uh, uh, abilities for social manipulation and so on, I think that we are so close to the point or could be so close to the point uh, where um, uh, AI is able to do this kind of strategic thinking that we need new ideas for evaluation uh, of, of, of these capabilities uh, before we deploy the models. I think that, the, so, so there is respectable work today in, in evaluation of these AI systems uh, before release. But I don't, even though this work is very respectable and very interesting, it is still not good enough uh, that uh, we can uh, trust uh, the uh, machines not doing dangerous things. So in particular, I think that if GPT-5 is released uh, with the same level of uh, uh, capability evaluations as GPT-4 was, then we just cannot be sure that we'll survive that. And for me, the conclusion is then easy. We should just pull the brakes until we know how to do this in a safe way. Okay, uh, thank you, Ulla. Uh, let's uh, move on to a question from Gordana. Mm -hmm. uh, Ulla, uh, could you comment on the rumor that Altman was planning to start using neuromorphic chips? I don't think I can. I don't know about this. No. Maybe Gordana can add something here? No, it's it's just a rumor I, I've heard, mm -hmm. and uh, I wondered if you have heard more. I mean, he he uh, had plans for, or maybe has plans uh, for a, a chip factory in the United Arab Emirates or something. But this, I'm not sure I've seen this term neuromorphic, or even what it means. Uh, it means inspired by human brain or or mm. biomimetic design. No. Mm. no, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Maybe you can point me to to your sources. Yeah, I send you a mail. Thank you. Okay, and uh, now we have uh, another comment from Maurits. Uh, thanks for the talk. You probably also have been reading about this Q-star breakthrough that could be the basis of the recent turmoil at yes. OpenAI. Any ideas about that? Yes, as I said, I don't think that this is the true basis of, of, of the turmoil. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, it could be a very, very uh, carefully guarded secret. Uh, I don't know. People... Uh, who are close to the inside, who have speculated about what the Q story really is about, think that it's something, some some breakthrough in, in uh, AI for doing uh, logic and mathematics, uh, which might uh, help uh, uh, machines become better at reasoning in, in several steps. I mean, today, um, 
logic and mathematics are really the only fields where, where you can concatenate a long sequence of steps uh, and be sure that you get correct conclusions from, from, from a, a correct uh, starting point. Uh, and uh, if, if you get um, the AI to be able to do that, it might also be uh, become better at uh, concatenating steps for long-term planning, and that could turn out to be really, really important. That's the direction that, that semi-insiders have um, speculated. I don't know. Okay, thank you, Ulla. Uh, and now we are on the hour of this seminar. So we can just address the final question from Laura. Uh, she's asking, has the UN taken any steps in thinking about AI on a global level? Uh, they have launched a, a committee uh, for, for uh, well, basically an, an, an AI panel. Uh, within the UN, but I don't know anything more concrete than that. Well, we've seen a list of names, but but what this committee will actually do uh, is not so clear. But but if your suggestion is that uh, the UN should play a role here, uh, then I wholeheartedly agree. Okay, and uh, that will round off the seminar for today. Uh, thank you very much, Ole. Uh, thank you.